Hello, everybody, and welcome to the what we can call the siblings uh, siblings uh, issue uh, sub plenary. Uh, I will not uh, say a lot. Just uh, that uh, we are very uh, stressed on time, so uh, I will introduce all of us together uh, and. Uh, we are my uh, Avi Berman. Can you raise your hand, Avi, so that people will know you? Okay. Smadar uh, Ashuach, thank you, and myself, Gila Ofer. We are all siblings in Israel in, in, uh, co from a collegial like, point of view. We are all psychoanalysts and group analysts in the same institute. So uh, each of us will uh, uh, talk about 20 minutes and then we will still have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, hopefully we have that. Uh, unfortunately, I have to start, so <laughs> I will be the first. And I start with a poem uh, from Antigona. I'd never have done it for children of my own not as their mother, nor for a dead husband lying in decay. No, not in defiance of the citizens. What law do I appeal to claiming this? If my husband died, there'd be another one. And if I were to lose a child of mine, I'd have another with some other man. But since my father and my mother too are hidden away in Hades house, I'll never have another living brother. This is from Antigona by Sophocles. Antigona is torn between her love for her brother, who deserves a burial, and his being an enemy, who must be treated as one. Well. She chooses to openly side with her brother and bury him, meaning that she too will die. She knows she will die. As in doing so, she violates the law of Creon the king. Julian Mitchell, Juliet Mitchell noticed years ago the prominent lack of engagement with the issue of siblings in psychoanalysis and started to refer to this in her writing. She conceptualized lateral relations between siblings among an autonom autonomous horizontal axis, but this axis interacts with the vertical parent-child axis. Everyone who engages in group analysis is in need, in need of this material. But in psychoanalysis too, in individual treatment, there is no analysis without the appearance of prominent elements related to siblings, whether younger brothers, twins, older brothers, or being a single child. In the essay, From the Sibling Trauma to the Law of the Mother, Mitchell emphasizes that it is not only the siblings who are absent from psychoanalysis, the mother is too. One can say that the mother, since Melanie Klein is not so much absent, but she is present as an object, an object for the child that becomes an inner object, but not as a subject. Mitchell adds a very important role for the mother a mother that connects to reality in general and mainly to social reality. The law of the mother is related to this. If the mother doesn't lay down the law of the mother, she causes division, denial, and dissociation from the social aspect. The law of the mother originates uh, as a source of authority that sharply distinguishes between the mother and the toddler. The toddler is not identical to the mother. It cannot give birth to children. This is the vertical axis that enables the tra transition to the horizontal axis, which is also the social axis. The law of the mother or organizes the sibling trauma and enables the infant to grow into the social. It forbids the infant from murdering its sibling and similarly forbids sexuality 
between siblings. This law is rooted in the motherly attitude of love to each child. Each child is special and equivalent. And this implies that each child is unique and equal at the same time. This is also the law that consecrates differences between parents and infants. And it precedes the law of the father, which is related to the Oedipal complex. Eventually, this law enables coping with the need to be special and unique. Everyone is similar to everyone else only in a partial sense. And with the need for intimacy and trust, it is a law, therefore, it, that is located in the unconscious as well as the law of the father. The application of the law of the mother is gr a gradual process of negotiation in which the infant discovers and creates the social aspect. This description is reminiscent of the transitional space that Winnicott wrote about. This process carries, uh, carries the risk of losing uniqueness and omnipotence if it is carried out in a sharp and unenabling ma manner. Winnicott described the process occurring between mother and baby. And I argue that this process also takes place among siblings due to the law of the mother. It is a process of concurrent love and hate in which one subject sibling must discover the other sibling one through his, dist dist through his destruction and the ability of the other, in this case, the sibling, not to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Thus, the destruction of the sibling object removes him from the omnipotent control of the subject sibling. The sibling object develops an autonomy and life of its own because it survived and contributes to its own subjectivity. It's a mutual process, of course, between two siblings such as I have seen among my children when they were little, and to an extent today as well, when they would get into serious fights and struggle with each other, and finally come out of the process hugging and loving each other. To quote Winnicott, this is a position that can be arrived at by the individual in early stages of emotional growth, only through the actual survival of cathected objects that are at the same time in process of becoming destroyed because real, becoming real because destroyed. And uh, this part is the, a short theoretical part of what it is, uh, the law of the mother and how it leads us into the social uh, realm. But I want to bring uh, an example from group analysis where we have uh, uh, found a case describing something like this. Lily was referred to me at her request. She had spent some two, two years in individual therapy and decided, contrary to the opinion of her therapist, to terminate uh, and seek group therapy. At the intake interview, she stated that her reason for wanting to join the group was a bewildering recollection occasioned by a dream that she was ostracized by her classmates through, uh, throughout sixth grade. She couldn't remember the reason for being ostracized, nor had she talked to anyone about it since. In addition, she said, that she lost her job and didn't know exactly why. And she added, anyway, I quote, anyway, I didn't like my colleagues and my boss was too bossy, end of quote. She related that her mother adored her sister, but was emotionally indifferent to her. The mother abandoned her at an early age, but took her sister with her for reasons that were unclear to her. She also had little knowledge of why her mother eventually came back with her sister. Lily ended up avoiding any kind of relationship with both her sister and her mother for years, refusing any attempt on the part of friends and family to bring them back in touch. She seemed to be a highly intelligent woman, somewhat aggressive, 
and having little capacity for self-reflection. Immediately upon joining the group, Lily began assuming a dominant position. Anyone who chose to share anything was bombarded by a barrage of questions. She seemed never to run out of interpretations or the inclination to offer them. It was clear that these interpretive interventions were her way of overcoming her fear of being ignored by the group. The group itself, which had been somewhat listless before her arrival, snapped into liveliness. They accepted her at first with enthusiasm. Whenever Lily spoke, however, the group would fall silent. Some members couldn't hide their admiration. In others, her dominance evoked much resistance and they saw her behavior as condescending. This affected me and more than once I felt paralyzed. I felt as if she was looking at the members and me as little children. The members who were angry with her didn't spare her their opinion. I could tell that she was deeply offended by this and offered the following group intervention. I quote, it is not easy for you to accept someone new into the group. Some of you are silent because you are swallowing your anger at me for bringing someone new into the group and letting her controlling the group. Since you can take it, you can't take it out on me, you're angry at Lily, who has no trouble speaking in her mind. That same night, she sent me a text, thanking me for defending her. From that session on, however, her domineering behavior grew more and more pronounced. She shared nothing but about herself while handling out uh, abandoned interpretations to anyone else. The other members commented on this, but she only said, I'm not keeping any of you from talking. Something about her tone became more and more arrogant. She occasionally criticized me, claiming that I offered someone the wrong interpretation. She also complained that I talked too little. When I said that my silence makes her relive or relieve her experience of being abandoned, she laughed and said that I can't touch her. Quoting, you can only touch the others here, but not me, end of quote. The hint of sadomasochism in her words worried me. I felt that she challenged me and couldn't accept me as a conductor of the group. I was concerned for her and for the group. In one of the sessions, she did mention being ostracized many years ago, and it was like murdering her when she was ostracized but her tone was distant and void of emotion. I said to her, you're trying to show us that you don't care about this harsh ostracism. It is a terrible punishment and you have no idea why it happened to you. Maybe you even prefer not knowing because you are afraid that it might hurt too much, but your face tells us that you're hurting. Maybe you are afraid that this group will also cast you out. She felt silent and withdrew beyond our reach. I thought that she felt accused. She soon resumed her onslaught of condemning questions and interpretations against anyone who shared anything personal. One day, when another member shared some difficult feelings that he felt concerning his daughter, she suddenly blurted out that she also has something to share with the group. She told us, that she threw her son from her first marriage. The first marriage ended many years ago. She threw him out of the house and he hasn't spoken to her for over a year. She did so because her current partner told her that he couldn't stand having him around. The group was dumbfounded. Most members pointed out her son's pain at having been abandoned. I turned to the group and said, Lily's son is certainly having a difficult time, but she herself is torn between wanting the love of her husband and that of her son. In driving your son out, Lily, you were actually repeating in your distress what your mother had done to you. More than this, what you picked up from your mother 
is that there is no possibility of loving two loved ones at the same time, each in a unique way. I was quite anxious in saying this, and I didn't know how she might take it. In the following session, I was glad to hear that she had contacted her son. Things were still very fragile, but they were back on speaking terms. That was the last time that she used the group to work on her own issues. A month had gone by and Lily Kemp kept bombarding anyone who shared with endless questions. Her dominance seemed to dwarf the other members. In one of the sessions, another member by the name of Ruthie snapped at her. Cut it out, Lily. We are sick and tired of you bossing us around again and again, and you, don't, and you won't give us enough time to answer you. Lily turned red and mercilessly went on the offensive. Who even ask you anyway? What right do you have telling me what to do? You're so narcissistic, so self-absorbed. You can respect, you cannot respect me, fatty. So I said, there is so much anger here now because you feel that only one of you can survive as if the other is being rejected, murdered. Lily started lashing out in such a way that I could no longer reason with her. She told me, I quote, I don't want to listen to you. What do you think you are doing? Going about showing things in my face, sitting there, thinking all the time, creasing your forehead, trying to figure things out. You usually end up not getting anything. You have no idea what you're doing. What kind of therapist are you? And there are people sitting here who used to be your patients and they have this direct line to you that I don't even see. I can be a better therapist than you. I can't stand you people and you, and you to me, she says, most of all. She got up from her chair and said that she would mail me a check for her unpaid session. The group members were in shock and we were coming on the end of the session. She saw them outside and told them, well done, you puked me out, just like I've been puked out before. Naturally, I was left with a difficult feeling. My further attempts to reach out to her outside the group, outside the group setting, were unsuccessful. In the following session, group members talked about how she was actually reenacting her childhood experience, unable to change. Being or staying in a group for Lily was like reviving the archaic pain where her mother was more absent than, than present. She couldn't give her, both her children the feeling of being loved in a unique way. So Lily wouldn't accept me as a conductor mother and not and couldn't enter the group, the social world, where more than one person can exist. She could only survive by fighting or dominating and murdering, quoting, the others in her psychic life. She could feel, she could feel her uniqueness in a twisted way, avoid and deny her feelings of rejection and abandonment. This, however, pre prevented her from experiencing acceptance and support when these were offered by the group. She ended up leaving the group without attaining truth change. And I bring this uh, case or this vignette because I could see, and we talked about it later, that she came from a, a family where there was no law of the mother. It was clear that her sister was the unique one, the loved one, and she was the rejected one. And she couldn't enter the social world of being really uh, unique and loved and sharing. Mm -hmm. I stop here because we have to be uh, very uh, concise. And uh, yeah, I will uh, let the others talk. If, I, if we have time later, I will uh, talk about a look at society as a whole re relating to this law of the mother. Abby, please. 
Uh, hello, everybody. I put uh, my text on the screen so I can see only part of you. Uh, the title of uh, my lecture is uh, Discrimination and its uh, Therapeutic Recovery in Group Analysis. But you okay, have to come closer, Avi. Come yeah. closer to the mic. How, how it is now? Better? Yeah. Yes, yes better. Yeah. Okay, okay. Can you make your volume louder? Uh, I'm not sure, just a minute. Uh, I can uh, go closer to the mic. How is it now? Can you hear me? It's not yes, great. It's not it's very great. loud. Okay. So I'll do my best. And this lecture presents the reality of frequent discrimination in our lives as a deviation from the law of the mother. The law of the mother, as it is suggested by Juliet Nietzsche, aims at protecting her children by forbidding each of them from getting rid of its siblings, which is murder, or transgressing sexual boundaries, which is incest. Its implementation entails a partial expulsion of the elder ch a child from the newborn baby out of home and into the company of his peers. Yet, as children who lost their unique mother's love and pushed away from her exclusivity of mother-child relation, we lose some and we gain some. The children gathering may establish the utmost benefit attributed to intersubjective encounter. The children meet other children that are like them and feel empowered. They meet other children who are different and feel challenged. We assume that this combination of belonging and challenge cultivates ego strength and increases the capacity for containing tension and tolerating differences. The mother's love, the condition, and the imperative join together to create the horizontal axis and in fact the social dimension itself. Within the horizontal axis, we see the formation of unique relationships between siblings, contemporary, the peer groups, and other similar terms that are used to denote the universal character of family relations. The matrix, or a familiar term, belongs to the horizontal perspective. In contrast to the vertical axis of parent-child relations, which serves as the model for authority relations. We suggest that group th uh, therapy is based on restorative and empowering part of the horizontal axis. The three of us here bring different perspectives that aims at combining the thinking about the horizontal axis and the law of the mother, especially to group analysis. Let's talk a bit about discrimination. Despite the law of the mother, the situation in which mother preserves the rights and wishes of her children is not guaranteed in advance. It is contingent upon intentionality and emotional and practical attention. This attention adds another duty and effort to the role of the mother, which is in any case full to the brain. But in the absence of such intentionality, the law of the mother may not be applied or it may even be completely obliterated. It seems that beneficent application of the law of the mother is no more representative of everyday reality than the notion of the good enough mother. The law of the mother and, the act and its actual conduct and actual mothers are not one in the same. It might be broken by mothers themselves. The most severe violation, in my view, is discrimination among her children. Indeed, if discrimination involves favoring one person in the rejection of another, one receives paternal, life, uh, a paternal love and the other a still face. One is privileged and the other is disenfranchised. The offering of one is accepted while the other is condemned, like Cain and Abel. One wins the inheritance and the other is denied of it. 
was included and the other is excluded. Any child may be the object of positive or negative discrimination, regardless of sex, age, or order of birth. Discrimination is an archaic human phenomenon. The first murder that is mentioned in the Bible, the murder of Abel and Cain, Abel by Cain, is presented as a result of unexplained discrimination by God. In her book, Mitchell mentions an anthropological testimony given by Cecil Williams regarding children and mother on the African Gold Coast. In many families, particularly poor ones, the mother lets go of her child when a new baby is born. She is completely invested in the new baby and in caring for it with a complete devotion and love. The baby enjoys an ideal life until the next sibling is born. The child that is let go sometimes undergoes a sudden and traumatic weaning that might be dangerous both physically and psychologically. These children develop a typical disease due to the lack of protein. The children who are let go grow up to be enraged and bitter. Discrimination characterizes relationships within family, between individuals and groups. All of these have brought us into group therapy. Now I'm going to uh, bring a short vignette. Dan is a lawyer. He's over 50 and in group psychotherapy for a year. He lost his sister after her long struggle as a cancer patient. Dan was his mother's favorite. When he was born, his only sister was four years old. As soon as he was born, she was forsaken by her mother, losing her love and attention, except for sudden expression of affection or care, which came and went unexpectedly. Until he came to individual therapy some years ago, then has no idea that he was a favorite child. For him, that was his life, plain and simple. In his first meeting with me, I found out that discrimination is a major subject in his work as a lawyer. In our individual meeting before he joined the group, he told me, you have no idea what I see here. I saw a mother who told her third child which she excluded from the inheritance. I never wanted you. I saw two sisters who lost their part in their inheritance because the mother preferred her son, their brother. The relationship between them is dead, and if they could ever exact their revenge upon him, they will. When I came, I influenced things, Ben said. Many times it's a lost case. And then he added, when my sister passed away, I said to her husband, you don't have to worry. You'll get everything you deserve. We are going to love each other here and respect her wish. That was done resolution of his early sibling uh, trauma, his personal moral of the disaster he meets in his work. Upon joining the group, Dan was a pleasant and friendly participant. He listened patiently and thanked the group members for letting him belong. Gradually, however, as he began to feel at home, his behavior changed. He talked a lot, addressed the participant and centered himself in the communication in the group. For moments, he seemed to be competed with me on the conductor position as he imagined it, and striving for privileged status. Seema, one of the veteran participants who had been active so far, fell silent. As a conductor, I saw what happened in the group as a kind of reconstruction of his status in his family. He, the star, and she, his excluded sister. I postponed my intervention in the process to give the group room to intervene before me. However, apart from a few glances at me, the group member did not turn to me, nor confronted him. They, they did not seem to expect me as a conductor to help them. It occurred to me that they see me as accepting his favorite position. I thought to myself, 
that their past siblings trauma has taught them that parents may discriminate some of their children and that's life. My first intervention addressed the group as a whole. I said that it is clear that the group is now divided into those who speak easily versus those who become increasingly silent. The resonance to what I said came immediately from Sarah, a veteran participant who had difficulty entering the group discourse. She said, for some times now, I think that there are classes in the group. Those who talk easily talk mainly among themselves. The other are much less present here. The group was dealing with the class issue and different voices were heard. I cannot get into details now. At a certain moment, three members turned to Dan and spoke one with the other. They told him that he had changed since he joined the group and that they came to see him as an arrogant, inconsiderate person. Dan looked surprised and hurt. Later in the session, I approached him and tried to bridge the gap between the participant experience of him and his own personal experience. I said that he really does seem involved and caring, but he does so through taking a lot of time and space to himself at the expense of those who are not as self-confident as he is. For the next meeting then came different. He said that in the past people had drifted away from him without telling him why, or he could not remember why. Now he hears for the first time what is their point of view and how do they feel. Sarah now stood up to him gently. She said, as a child I was like your sister. My brother was the diamond in my mother's crown. She always justified me. She did not uh, protect me when he broke my doors, but always protected him. I'm glad that I can say this to you, but I also like you. From what you told us, I see you are, that you understand and care for other people. They looked very, both very moved. There was a significant change in Dan's behavior afterwards. I noticed the oscillation of the contribution of the group members and myself as the conductor. The two axes, the vertical and the horizontal, were working together to create a therapeutic value of the group. And now back to group analysis. We may assume that like any one of us, each participant come to the group therapy already battled by life event in which each of them had felt unprotected by the parents, some of us are victim of discrimination, still unable to grasp the tragic meaning of their replaceability. Group analysis is a special advantage with regard to sibling relations. In the group, participants meet brothers and sister figures. In many ways, the experience of the group raises each one's experience of the sibling's trauma on one hand and feeling of fraternity and partnership on the other. One of the greatest contributions of the group is that it helps the participant to move away from the solitary of being discriminated and get closer to a deep empathic mutual recognition of themselves, acknowledging their belonging to the universal human situation. In its most rehabilitating form, discrimination undergoes transformation for being a fateful blow of deprivation to sharing the universal existence experience of mutuality. Furthermore, this belonging encourages and recognizes alternating uniqueness. The contribution of each individual in the group is rewarded with recognition and empowerment. Something of the grandiose uniqueness of being once the only love child is exper experienced once again in a partial, fleeting, alternating manner. In our groups, member may, sensitive and, and may be sensitive and vulnerable in front of our blind spot as conductors of discriminating one or favoring another. I believe that the conductor should incorporate the derivatives of the law of the mother into his professional position. By implementation of the law of the mother, the group conductor may create a space 
in which the group members may experience protection good enough safety and mutual empathy. In this space, sibling trauma may be worked through and painful experiences of discrimination may be repaired by reciprocity and exchange. It became clear to me that participants might not expect the conductor to address discrimination because the siblings trauma told them not to wait for it anymore. As conductor, we should know that the participants' silence in the face of injustice may result from such trauma during their lives. The privileged do not complain and the underprivileged do not protest. The therapeutic recovery of discrimination in group analysis may be based on benign cooperation of the horizontal axis of the participants and the vertical dimension of the conductor contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Avi. Uh, okay. We really uh, consider one another very, each other very, uh, very well. So 20 minutes, 20 minutes, and now Smadar. No, I want, I want to change my plane. Uh, okay. uh, excuse me, Avi and Gila, but I see that the people faces, and I think about reading another article, it will be too much, but I want to, to say what I wrote about, and I would like to, to show a couple of things that I think is important in understanding the important, in my eyes, of the sibling trauma and the, uh, the law of the mother. So I will read, what I was going to, to write, to read to you is a, a, the experience of the thief, the thief of the rights of the firstborn as echo in individual and group therapy. And I hope this will be an article will go out in a couple of, I, I hope not years in group analysis. So you will be able to read it. It's on process. I hope so. But I, I want to say a couple of, I will, start reading just the first paragraph and then I will speak a little bit about why it is so important in my eyes because I think about therapy is as something that you have to reenact something in the therapeutic encounter that that you will get treatment and the the siblings relationship are uh, something that you reenact in group analysis. It's less possible in, it, it's not, not possible, but it's less possible in individual therapy. And that's make, for me, that's make the huge difference for why group analysis is so important. And also, it's a way of thinking about the society also. Because for instance, just for, one thinking that I had from this symposium is that the large group last, last night, I thought about siblings' rivalry between the Israeli and the Palestinian, but one of the problems, the main problem, is that there is no law of the mother. There is no mother. We collapse the mother. Now, the British think that they are the mother, but there are just making the revival more uh, intense. So what I wanted to, to acknowledge and, and say is that, and I'm reading now, Juliet Mitchell's concept about sibling trauma and the law of the mother gave me a relevant and useful theoretical framework in analysis and especially in group analysis. Mitchell offers us a theory that is universal and speak of the importance of sibling relationship in our emotional development, which is correct, whether you are the only child, the firstborn, the twin, or the youngest in the family, or you don't have, even if you don't have any siblings, the moment you go out, you have to recognize that you have siblings, okay? So it's happened to everyone, and it's an exclusion. That's another uh, paper that I'm writing now. It's about the ex exclusion that you feel in the group analysis, that it's it's um, it's have to be it's a de developmental exclusion. Like the child have to realize that he is excluded from the parents' uh, bedroom, and that's a vertical axis. He has also to be to realize and to accept 
that he is excluded from the place that he thought was his unique place. That, that's the, the majesty baby. He has to realize that he can't be in this place forever. He has to be excluded from this. So sibling trauma is the developmental and for everyone the arrival or the non-arrival of a sibling contained traumatic annihilation of the baby who was the one and the only until that moment. A change critical in emotional development. Everyone's must, everyone must deal with the realization that they are not the only one who is unique, that there are others who are singular like themselves and that they are part of an equal status with others a part of the series. I claim that the experience of an annihilation differ according to the interaction that is created in the encounter between two axes. Now think about two axes, yes? The vertical axis of parent-child, that is the law of the father, and that the law of the father is between generation, and the horizontal axis of the sibling relationship, that is the law of the mother. We can think of two axes that meet and create a full space that influence and is influenced by both. Everyone has its unique, its own unique experience. So I wanted to, to focus in this uh, uh, lecture on the traumatic experience that I think it's also not just uh, specific to the first child, that's the thief of the right of the firstborn, because it's a universal experience influenced by the interactions of the two exes. Why I say it's not just for the first uh, one, because the, the thief of the right of the firstborn can be for a performance of lecture or everything that you are doing the first time. And the feeling that someone is taking out of you this Thing is reenactment in your life. So I, I want to say this and uh, the, the, the stories that I wanted to, to uh, I, I gave, I wanted to give a, um, a clinical case, but I also want, I wanted to, um, to refer to ISO and, uh, and Jacob about the thief of the first right. But I also, I can skip it also, and I just, uh, I just want to, to say that in our clinical work, we encounter many stories of patients who come with great pain and injury, owning to the thief of the right of the firstborn. Either concretely in the family, when one child receives more, that's what Avi was talking about, are loved more, taken better care of, or through a social experience in which either place, achievement, or connection that the person held first was stolen. A lot of time when I'm speaking about sibling relationship, I'm telling about my youngest son that he is now 20 years old, but when he was nine years old and I was start writing about sibling, he said to me that as being an, the oldest child as I am, I will never understand him as the youngest one. Okay, because everything that he's doing, the, biggest ones did it already. And if he's, if he's doing something new, they're doing it very quickly, much easier than him. And also the house is, when, when the first one is born, the house is a, a, a year by year have more children. When he is born, the house is getting emptier. And that's really a different emotion um, uh, feelings that you have to understand as a therapist and especially I think as good set, uh, as group analyst. Now I I really I can give you the the example for my analytic group, but I I feel that we have an half an hour and I re really uh, a quarter of an hour, no? No, what, half, an hour, half an hour. Half an hour. And I want to suggest that you, maybe we're not so many people, if you want to ask question or speak about it or think about it and the importance of this. I just want to say also that 
Avi and me are editing a book about the horizontal axis now, mm -hmm. about sibling relationship, and I hope it will go out in the next year. But I really would love you, I, I would love to, to speak with you, and not just go on with the lecture. So, what do you say? Gila? You, you want a sibling, a sibling uh, experience here, that we are yeah. all... Uh, together like siblings not uh, not the lecturers like parents coming here bringing things but everybody is equal to everybody and uh let's talk then and we'll see not everyone is equal but everyone is unique unique everyone, everyone is unique on. you may, you may, you may. Um, but, but I have a question. Sorry, Morris. Can I can I say something? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I I wanted to say hi to Esmada because I've been writing to you and it's been it's really nice to see your face because I already knew Gila and Abby, but I didn't know you. So and I love the fact that you want us as siblings to talk to you, and and I just want to say thank you. I, I understood the the law of the mother much better today, even though I had tried and tried reading <laughs> the book, but actually it was much more clear today when you gave the examples and talk about it. And, and I also think like Esmada, I have understood my, my patients through where I am in the position in the family, being the youngest and finding it difficult to understand the oldest, mm -hmm. getting really angry with them sometimes, you know, like, how dare you? Um, and, and I think that is very important. That's why I, you know, thank you for what you're doing. I just want to say about this, uh, Maria Jose, it's, it's really important that, uh, that I didn't say before, the difference, the really the big difference between the youngest and the oldest is that the oldest come to the world and it's taking more time. He's more time the only one. And he thinks that everyone belongs to him. That's the way, of, and he always, wants people to ask him to come, to invite him to join them in doing something. The youngest, of, of course, what I'm saying is, is, yeah, it's too general, but it's, it's important. The youngest fight for the place. They know, how, they know more how to fight to, to, to uh, have a place. So it's, it's a way of, a lot of youngest uh, therapists don't understand the oldest one that they think that they deserve everything. <laughs> and that's why I'm very good at stopping Maurice from talking because I have to take my place. <laughs> I'm very aware of that with you, Maurice, who's uh, you're very good at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Already we have it. <laughs> yeah, bring it on. Uh, I, Smadar, I wanted to ask you to say something about the interaction between the vertical and the horizontal axis, um, because you said something that sounded very important, which is that the fear of annihilation is a very strong word, and I think it's a very important word in sibling relationships. I think that it often comes into the murderous dynamic between them. Uh, but if you could say how that, I think you said that the quality or the fear of annihilation depends on the interaction between the horizontal and the vertical axis. Um, could you say more about that? I can say now or Gila, what do you say? Or let's, I can, I, I would just say in two words. The, the, the vertical axis is between uh, the parents and the children, okay? And yeah. then the, 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 the main issue is we are the parents, you are the children, you can't have the mother or the father because we are the couple, okay? Yeah. And that's the vertical axis and you are excluded from this relationship, okay? Yeah. The mother, that she can be also the father, yes, the law of the mother said, all of you are equal, okay, but unique. So I, I can give to every one of you what they need in this time or, and, and you are all equal. I won't let you harm each other 
and I want them to kill or uh, abuse, sexually abuse each other, okay? But the mother said it, as, and, and she said, when I have the first, when I have now another child, you have to go to the society. You have to find your place in the society, okay? Now, why I'm taking, I'm speaking about encounter between the two exes, because what the parents are doing between the siblings will affect a lot of what will happen between the siblings, like the large group yesterday, okay? The large group was yesterday was really a good example mm. of, I, I'm, I'm not sure that the British are the mother, but in the, the group analysis society, they stand for the mother. They are the father. Okay, the father and the mother, it doesn't matter. Still, they became between the Israelis and Palestinians, and we have enough problem without them. <laughs> Let me, can I add to this, can I add to this something? Uh, because I think the vertical is also part of the law of the mother. It's not only law of the father, but it has, the vertical part in the law of the mother is that you children, you cannot have children yourself. It's only me who can have children. It doesn't relate to the relationship between father and mother, mainly to what the mother can do. The mother can have children, and the children cannot have children. This is also important because it takes them away from their narcissistic part, which is important. And it, in this way, put them into the horizontal uh, axis, uh, out of love, as I said, uh, to enter into the so so into society, where you are, as you said, Smadar, uh, where you are unique. Not everybody is equal, but everybody is unique. May I add something? Maybe, maybe uh, it's just difficult. Just a minute. Uh, Let me just say that something has happened here. That Smadar was the last one, and she's like the younger. A younger <laughs> child who knows how to fight her time into into this uh, area here. If you want to go to this, Smada was also the first one who brings Juliet Mitchell and her <laughs> to group analysis, but yeah. that's another issue. <laughs> can I say something? Yeah. Uh, can I say I something, that Smada, that Can you uh, can you be the chairperson of the discussion on the side? Would you like to do it or do you know? uh, We cannot, I just, we I cannot just hear you. Add, I just wanted to add for the, the uh, Maurice uh, question that uh, there is no law for the uh, inter-cooperation of the two assets. And you can find uh, all kinds of examples. Some of them are very bad and some of them are very good. Oppression is the overpowering of the vertical axis over the horizontal axis. And rebellion is the uh, example for uh, overpowering of the horizontal axis over the vertical axis. But, in, and maybe nowadays, we are uh, learning something new because uh, uh, the corona and the uh, our coping with the corona are very much horizontal nowadays. And, uh, but in group analysis, uh, we, can, uh, we can plan it ahead. We can uh, make it uh, part of our professional uh, attitude. We can make some uh, sophisticated collaboration between the two axes. The horizontal and the vertical axis may join together into creating the, therape the therapeutic uh, value of the group. Can I say something? Very interesting. Sure. Okay. Go, go ask. Susie, go. what you wanted to say? I, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm sure horizontal and vertical are very important, but I can't relate to it emotionally, whereas I had a very big desire to speak because I'm a middle child and so there's it's like there's the oldest and the youngest but hang on a second what about the middle ones and 
my experience is this is a hugely emotional subject but the, the feelings about siblings are very very powerful right the way through to when my parents died then the arguments of who was in charge between me and my older sister and my brother were powerful and murderous and incredibly painful that they're they're lifelong they're hugely emotional and i'm somehow with the talk of the horizontal and the vertical i i, I just wanted to re, re, remind myself that this is powerful stuff and it's in our groups and i'm really glad that you're talking about it and that's why i'm here okay. it's not much talked about and it's also not much known about I, I've been doing sibling workshops as an introduction to group analysis and people are very interested in finding out what they have in common if they are oldest or youngest or middle children. Yeah. I think part of the difficulty is that you helpfully bring out, um, you did Gila, the pre oedipal aspects of the um, likely original trauma. So then you get repression and you, people are, you know, oldest children's mother may indeed be, as you say, they may feel entitled or they may through um, uh, reaction formation feel mm -hmm. responsible, which I think is why there are so many oldest children therapists and youngest children. Yes, they may fight their way or they may have to find some other strategy. It, it's a little more complex. The point I'm trying to make is that although we're very fascinated, but it's very well repressed for most of, most of us. There's a, a family therapy exercise, I don't know if anybody's done it, where you meet strangers and then you are asked to go mm. around the room in silence and find somebody like yourself. Is this a familiar exercise? Yes, yeah. I've done that. Yeah, yeah. I've done it. It's astonishing. Sure. And the, the oldest children, and then you find two more people. So you're in groups of four. I did this in a group of about 60 and all the oldest children found each other and all the youngest children found each other and all the middle children found each other and two people couldn't find anybody and they were the adoptees in the, in the group. And it was so, once people understand it, they get it. But it's so, it's very difficult to enable that getting it. Joe, you want to say something. Joe, unmute. Yes, thank you. I, I raised my hand uh, on the uh, participant list, so we'll see if that if that worked. I, maybe that was what you were noticing. Um, I, and uh, thank you for your comments. I think I had heard some of these at uh, IPA. Right. Uh, and it was good, good to hear kind of a new and more and a little bit revised. Um, I, I guess what I was thinking about is, um, you know, uh, thank you for bringing in Juliet Mitchell. I was thinking about her, uh, I don't know if it was sibling, maybe cousin, um, Stephen Mitchell, who cautioned um, at the birth of relational psychoanalysis, cautioned about what he called the developmental tilt. Um, which he emphasized to various degrees at various times. But the idea to reduce everything in psychoanalysis to uh, early patterns. And, and so what I was uh, thinking about is uh, not only the X and Y axis, but the Z axis or the Z axis, if you will. Uh, because um, by the time I had uh, entered my first group, when I was a psychiatry resident, not only had I been a sibling but by that point, I had been on a football team. I had been in the army. Um, you know, there were a lot of things that happened as siblings, if you will, beyond just my primary development. So I'm, so I'm interested in, in that too, and don't necessarily want to reduce it just to siblings. Not that that isn't important to get. I think it is important to get, but I think there's more to get than that. I'd like to add something. Um, I, I, I enjoyed, I, I know something about these presentations. I enjoyed them again, each time is different. And I liked your act of freedoms, Mandav. 
it, it was something that stirred something up. Um, and the questions of who is chairing this panel, I think it's part like a sort of a parallel process of, of the topic. Probably it is written somewhere, but the way it's happening, it, it brings up to life the issue itself, the oldest one, the youngest one. So uh, I wanted to say that it, it brings a lot of, a lot of life. Um, and uh, you made this sign about the two axes. And it reminded me the sign of the conductor of the large group yesterday when he tried a couple of times to stop the discussion and something did not work so well. So I'm really thinking about the meeting of the two axes because bringing the law of the mother and the uh, horizontal, it, it, it is very, very, very important. But I think that in these presentations today, what the three of you brought is the meeting of the two axes and thinking about what this meeting means. So I, for me, this was an emphasis that I found today and I wanted to share. And the gender aspect that uh, uh, at, at the beginning, I saw two male participants and then three male participants. And I, I was reminded that also when we talk about these topics at the program at the university. Also, the overwhelming number was of women uh, as compared to men. So uh, I'm thinking about women as looking upon being siblings and men, there is a question here. And it's related for me to the access, the meeting of the access. Anka, I'm not sure about the gender uh issue because I was thinking when Smadar spoke that one of the uh, difficult is that we are uh, uh, taking the name the law of the father for the vertical and the law the, of the mother for the horizontal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be a father that is the role of the uh, horizontal and, and a mother that is the role of the father. The father. So maybe I will have to, to take some other expressions that I'm not sure that I can say, but maybe authority and society, I don't know, something else that uh, it will be easier because in such a way we are putting all what we have inside and the, all the concept on the mother concept or on the father concept and it's not good for me. And it could, it, it and could. The thing, and the course, it's thing symbolic. To say is about the only child because I'm the only child, and uh, within <laughs> the, and I think for the for a, that the only child is quarrelling with the idea of another child that is inside the mother, and it will be inside the mother, and what will be after that, and he's already quarrelling and fighting with the idea of what is coming. Thank you for the uh, it, it could be that both parents together have responsibility for the horizontal axis. You know, that it's not just one parent, it's not just the mother or the father, but it's the two of them working together in a partnership in which they understand the importance of the children separating and going out into society because it's a difficult task uh, to, to facilitate that for the children. Uh, but I'd like to just share with you my experience with Juliet Mitchell because about 20 years ago, I chaired a meeting at IGA in London in which we invited her to speak about sibling relationships. And I got to know her fairly well during that period. She is in fact very keen on groups and did the group introductory course in Cambridge. But there was a particular thing that interested me which she spoke about and she had just written her book on hysteria and she linked the sibling dynamic to hysteria insofar as she said that when there's an existing child and a new child is born, because the existing child has been has had such a strong identity and attachment in the family 
and knows itself and is known, the new child is experienced as robbing the older child of its very being, of its very psyche, so that the older child feels that the younger child is sucking out from him or her his very life, which is what leads to the intense rivalry and the murderousness. And she linked that to his people who, uh, to hysteria in a way which I, I w didn't fully understand and I won't go into. But no, that there was a trauma honestly, in the uh, you, you have a phone open? You have an open phone when you speak, it makes some... Oh, does it? Is that what it is? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, but Maurice, you know, it's right. Juliet Mitchell said that she, she uh, started uh, dealing with siblings when she was looking about the hysteria with men, not just with women. She said it can't be just a woman, a, a pathology. And then she came on to the siblings idea and she mm -hmm. started to uh, research this. I would like to react to what uh, Susie uh, heard. Yeah, Maria. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I see that uh, Telefori, the way I pronounce your uh, name correctly. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you want we don't see that? your mouse. Avi, can you raise your face so that we can... Yes, okay. uh, I have a question, yes. Um, uh, just, just, a, yes okay. so, uh, just one minute. Uh, it is very important, I think, that, uh, to see the love of the mother as a, as a quality and not uh, as belonging to mothers or women. It, it may be adopted by uh, a man to by the siblings themselves, if they are mindful about it, and of course for therapists and group therapists. And uh, I feel very, much, I feel very good to uh, uh, characterize myself as uh, taking care of people uh, in the sense of the love of the mother, uh, even uh, uh, as, as, as a man, of course. And I don't. I, I can uh, adopt this um, concept uh, as a uh, universal quality. It needs only mindfulness. When parents are not mindful about keeping the love of the mother, which is uh, I think uh, too common, then uh, children may quarrel between themselves afterwards. There was one more question here. Someone yes. said yes. Well, I, well, the law of the mother seems to be the law of the first um, interactions also. And I, I was wondering how um, you said, for example, for the large group, is it connected to the English or... But I was wondering, is that not connected to the matrix? The horizontal. The horizontal is in the matrix. Yes, of it's course. It's almost... Mm -hmm. I want also to relate to the fact that uh, why do we say mother, father, and, uh, and why does uh, Juliet Mitchell relate to it in this way? She is a feminist and she came into psychoanalysis when everything was, we, we can say, dominated by men. And the law of the father, she's, she was also in France, and, and the law of the okay. father, Lacanian and all this was dominating. And for, I think she is a feminist and she wanted uh, even consciously to bring this law of the mother to show uh, some difference. Although as a feminist, she still uh, is, she was hardly criticized by feminists, but she really believes also in all the uh, psychoanalytic uh, laws and things that they bring. This is why she says it's unconscious. It's the law of the father is unconscious and the law of the mother is unconscious. And in this way, it doesn't really uh, um, matter whether the father is a woman or a man and the mother is a, a woman or a man. It is just symbolic when she says it. And we have to remember this. But it connects maybe to the fact that uh, in group analysis and here we have 70% uh, of women 
So could be. Yes. <laughs> so Yes, yes, Madame. Last word. Madame, you want no, to I said that it's not just a group analysis. Most of the therapists are women. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so we come to the end of our session. There is so much more to say about siblings and horizontal, uh, horizontal axis and society and all the examples from literature and Bible and things like this. The three papers hopefully will be in group analysis right soon and uh, will be, uh, you will be able to read them. Uh, okay, and we meet in the large group. Thank you all. Thank you, my brothers, my brother and my sister for this, <laughs> older or younger, whatever. <laughs> and uh, we'll meet in the large group. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.